Good afternoon. My name is Joel Hewitt, and I'm a subject matter expert at the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. We are pleased to present today's webinar on RFID for continuous monitoring in dynamic environments. Uh, and we've been having a little bit of technical difficulty with the Adobe Connect software this morning, uh, but it seems to be working out. Our speaker and presenter is Ray Wagner, PhD, joining us from NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And we will introduce him further in just a moment. As we begin, please note that the webinar chat function in the top right-hand corner of your screen is enabled. Feel free to type in any questions that you may have for Dr. Wagner as we go along. We will collate all your questions and answer them during a Q&A session at the end. Note also that we are recording this webinar. The video webcast will be available for download from our website tomorrow. A copy of today's slide deck will also be available for download at the end of the presentation and tomorrow on our website at hdiac.org. First, a bit of background regarding our center. We are a Department of Defense sponsored entity, one of three information analysis centers. Organizationally, we fall under the Defense Technical Information Center, known as DTEC, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our mission is to be the go-to R&D, S&T, and RDT&E leader within the Homeland Defense and Security community. We achieve this by providing timely and relevant information, superior technical solutions, and quality products to the DOD and HDS, COIs, and COPs. In doing so, we are able to help solve the most challenging technical problems facing the government. We pursue this mission across eight focus areas, alternative energy, biometrics, CDRN defense, critical infrastructure protection, cultural studies, homeland defense and security, medical, and weapons of mass destruction. Our external subject matter expert network is a critical tool in achieving this mission. Our SMEs provide unique insight into our focus areas and help us provide the most up-to-date and cutting-edge information and innovations to the military and government. If you have expertise in one or more of our eight focus areas and are interested in getting involved as a SME, please visit our website and apply. The roots of radio frequency identification, or RFID, can be traced back to the Second World War, when the Allies first attached identified friend or foe, or IFF, transmitters to their aircraft. When a plane's transmitter received an interrogative signal from an Allied radar station, it would broadcast back a set code, thus identifying itself as friendly. In their current form, RFID systems are typically used to identify, track, and monitor non-dynamically changing objects of importance. Retailers use such passive or non-powered RFID tags and stickers to prevent inventory theft. The large scanners placed at most store exits are indeed RFID readers. The Department of Defense also uses passive RFID systems for inventory management. In 2005, DOD began requiring select suppliers to mark their shipping pallets containers, and other unit loads with RFID tags, thus allowing DOD to trace materiel all the way from acquisition to disposal. A traditional passive RFID tag, when pinged by a reader or interrogator, broadcasts information that's really only about itself, say what object it's attached to or where and when the tag was read by a device. Next generation RFID systems, however, have demonstrated the ability to also return data generated by a wide array of sensors attached to RFID tags. Recent advances in material sciences, sensor miniaturization, and circuit engineering have opened up new opportunities for the application of RFID to a suite of military and homeland defense needs. Because a sensor and RFID tag combination can now be built at low cost and in a low size, weight, and power configuration, whole series of them can be effectively attached to remote sections of fixed assets or to vehicles in harsh environments. 
This allows for intelligent monitoring and control of assets where none has been possible before. Engineers have already investigated applying RFID sensor devices on critical infrastructure assets like aging bridges or the highly corrosion susceptible vertical face of railroad track segments. When attached to metallic objects, for example, these RFID sensor tags can monitor for variables as minute as the depth of a crack, changes in length and orientation of a crack in the metal, changes in its width and its angle, and changes in strain in the fatigue load that it's holding. Other research has already tested the use of embedding RFID sensor couples inside pores of high performance concrete. Temperature data sent by the device from inside the concrete block allows personnel to actively control the curing and maturation temperature of the batch. Proper maturation significantly reduces the likelihood that a given piece of concrete will suffer structural failure down the road. Structural health monitoring applications like the above are only one facet of RFID's potential usefulness to DOD. Other near-term applications include soil moisture monitoring for landslide detection and prevention, and the integration of sensors with fabric-based or even woven RFID antennas to connect the smart uniform of the future warfighter. However, to be achievable, these applications require RFID sensor systems that work in a fully wireless manner, that can function for very long periods of time without maintenance or access to electrical power, and that provide sensor data at transmission rates useful to operational analysts. As Dr. Wagner will explain today, his work has sought to prove the viability of such future, future systems by implementing them in what is perhaps one of the most challenging environments for any device, the inside of NASA's Orion Reentry Spacecraft's heat shield. Now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Ray Wagner leads the Wireless Sensor Network Research and Development Program at NASA Johnson Space Center, where he works on wireless communication systems designed for vehicle, human habitat, and surface operations. His research interests also include low power embedded computing and distributed signal processing. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from Rice University in 2007. And with that, Ray, we hand it off to you. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think that I couldn't think of a better introduction than that to the topic, so um, we will just go ahead and jump in. Uh, so, as Joel mentioned, uh, this is rooted in a challenge to do lightweight instrumentation for the Orion EM2 vehicle, which, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the flight manifest of Orion, that will be the first vehicle that will have crew on. Um, and, and the challenge here was to add in a, what we call a developmental flight instrumentation capability that had um, initially been zeroed out for mass savings. Um, and so we, uh, we were asked to say, you know, of the, the EFT-1 vehicle, which is the first and only Orion to have flown so far, uh, of that vehicle's, you know, um, several hundred pounds, several hundred channels, uh, Flight instrumentation system, you know, in excess of a thousand pounds. What could we, uh, what could we do for a budget of uh, several tens of pounds uh, to start to add in DFI channels back to that? Um, since it was the first vehicle that was going to have crew on it, and therefore there was, you know, quite an interest in continuing to instrument that. And so that um, that 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 took a couple of R and D thrusts. A sister branch of ours started looking at decentralizing a wired uh, developmental flight instrumentation system. And we, uh, in my branch, being the uh, uh, proximity wireless branch for Johnson Space Center, we decided to say, okay, what can we do with a wireless system here? And that had been rooted in quite a bit of work we've been doing over the past decade, looking into standards-based uh, solutions for doing wireless sensing, things that are, you know, your standard uh, Zigbee, if you're looking at uh, home automation kinds of technologies or, uh, wireless heart and ISA 100.11a if you're interested in something that's a little bit more robust of a solution and suitable for harsh industrial environments but still rooted in that same low power uh, phi and Mac that uh, and so uh, 
our challenge was not necessarily coming up with an exotic new kind of wireless sensor. It was coming up with a wireless interface for a sensor that already existed. Uh, with space vehicles especially, uh, the, the people that are interested in consuming that data want to be getting data from the kinds of thermocouples and the kinds of strain gauges they've always used. The question is, how do you interface a wireless transducer to that? And moreover, how do you do it in such a way that you can last you know, a very long time on what has got to be a self-contained power supply, effectively a battery? And how can you do that at a very low system mass? Since, you know, again, our challenge here was trying to add back in an instrumentation capability at the lowest mass uh, cost. And um, the reason we did that was a study of the EFT-1 developmental flight instrumentation system had, you know, identified that uh, of that, you know, um, in excess of a thousand pounds mass, approximately 60% of that mass was due to wiring. So, our goal was to really see, as we get rid of wiring, how much good can we do in storing that data. for us was that if we were going to have a truly useful wireless developmental flight instrumentation system, it had to be completely wireless. So not only did data acquisition have to be uh, powered uh, without interface to a power wire, but also communication did as well. If we are, if we are just a uh, just uh, driving data acquisition wirelessly, but having wires for communication, we suffer most of the mass penalty of, of the overbraid and the, the fasteners and the cable harnesses and all that stuff. You know, merely eliminating the copper for communication doesn't actually save us all that much. It's, it's the, the entire infrastructure of wiring that starts to become a problem. Um, it, it had to be capable of operating for years. So if you look at the way a vehicle like Orion is integrated, it comes together, together over the course of many, many months. Um, after it's integrated, there's quite a bit of uh, systems level checkout. You know, eventually it's going to be rolled out to the launch facility. That could take a while to do. It could have arbitrary pad delays. And then if you think about you know, taking a vehicle like that to Mars, uh, you know, by the time you get to Mars, by the time you return to Earth then, and you're actually interested in that uh, the heat shield data, so much time has passed that if the last time a technician got to touch that sensor and it switch it on was fairly early in the integration process, then you know you can forget it. If you have a, a small battery using you know standard techniques, it's going to be gone well before it's time to actually do this integration. So what you want to be able to do is switch it on at time of installation and have it hibernate at a very very low power cost until um, it's time for it to perform its. Uh, and, and you also, uh, you know, in the meantime, you want it to be able to be woken instantly at any point in time to participate in health status checks as a vehicle coming together to participate in, you know, status checks as you're cruising to your destination. And then also to just, you know, wake up when the mission clock says it's time to wake up and start actually doing it. And then it's got to be a very, very low mass. You know, again, we're doing this to save money. So you can't have, you can't solve this by hanging a very large battery. And so what we found out is that was going to eliminate your traditional active wireless solutions. They'd be like Bluetooth, Bluetooth, low energy, certainly like Wi-Fi. And the reason there, it's really driven by that hibernation. For those active protocols to be contactable, you know, you essentially have to either leave them connected to their, uh, their data hub at all times, which is impractical on a small battery, or you have to start to, you know, set up cycles where they wake up every so often and they contact it and they say, hey, is it time to do anything? And the hub, which is connected to the flight computer, would say, yeah, it's time to do something. Go ahead and wake up or no, go back to sleep. And that constant process of waking up and raising your hand and going back to sleep, uh, especially on a cycle that will allow for fairly immediate responsiveness to unexpected messages from your flight computer, is just going to kill any kind of small battery. So given that we weren't going to be able to make the active solutions uh, to work, we started looking into RFID for sensors, which is something we had been doing a little bit of looking at, but certainly not. Um, so, so what Joel introduced for the, uh, the Allied Aircraft Transponders is very much the way that commercial RFID tags work these days for inventory management. So you have small tags, you have very small integrated circuits on them, 
uh, no dedicated power supply, typically a very large antenna. And the way that works is an interrogator sends out some sort of continuous wave. The large antenna intercepts that, it rectifies it. That is used to charge up some kind of small capacitor on the board. And once that uh, capacitor uh, has enough uh, power on it to exceed the activation threshold of the uh, integrated circuit, then the integrated circuit wakes up and it begins interacting with the interrogator um, in you know, a, a, a collision mitigation protocol that finally allows the tag to respond. And when it does, it merely backscatters the interrogator's energy at the interrogator, but it modulates that energy to encode its unique identity. And so that's how a, an RFID interrogator goes through a field of tags and it gets the data, uh, the uh, ID off. So what we would like to do is use this for sensing. And so we would like those RFID sensor tags, in addition to just returning their ID, to return uh, some sort of sensor value of interest. And I'll pause and say this idea is not unique to us. Uh, RFID sensing has certainly been out in the world for you know the last 10, 15 years. The way RFID sensing typically works, it, it, it breaks down into uh, two categories. Uh, one is that the the device itself is uh, completely batteryless. It's fairly inert. And when it is hit with energy from the interrogator, it spends perhaps a bit more time charging up before it responds. And it uses that extra collected energy to activate some kind of data acquisition module, power and sample the sensor that it's attached to, then return that single sensor value along with its ID when it backscatters the clock. So it is very much uh, sensing on demand. The interrogator says, please give me a sample. The tag responds with both its ID and sample. The, uh, that's probably the biggest commercial instantiation of RFID sensing right now, and it's mostly targeted towards things like cold chain logistics. So as you're tracking cold, uh, cold custody items as they move through your inventory chain, you want to say, okay, what temperature are you at to you know, monitor that they haven't gone up? Another common way of using RFID for sensing is an RFID data logger, where you, you turn it on, it does have a battery. You, you tell it, okay, please begin sampling. You set it off somewhere, and it gathers enough samples to fill up an internal memory. Then sometime later, you, you collect that, you bring it back towards where an RFID indicator is, and you say, okay, please you know, transfer to me all of the data that you've gathered in the meantime. Um, but, but neither of those use cases really solve the problem that we're trying to solve. And, and what that problem is, is you know, given that we have to interface to a sensor that already exists, what we wanted to really do was come up with an Internet of Things style sensing architecture that still leveraged the capability of RFID to essentially get you your communication for free. And it's for free from the sensor's perspective. You know, we're really playing a sleight of hand here where the thing that's plugged into the wall or the vehicle and therefore has unlimited power is the thing that's providing all of the energy for communication. And so what we did was we leveraged a, a new, uh, reasonably new kind of RFID integrated circuit that's out there that uh, if you interface a, an RFID antenna to, it just looks like a normal RFID tag over the air. But it also has a small serial interface on it, so you can hang it off of a, a small, low-power processor like a microcontroller. And using that microcontroller, you can read and write at very little power cost the same memory banks of that tag that you can read and write over the air. And so if, you, um, if you're willing to tolerate a little bit of sleight of hand and you squint at it the right way, what it starts to look like is you've given that processor a radio that it essentially gets to use for. It's not exactly free, but you know, you're, it's, it's effectively a little EEPROM memory or something like that. So compared to, compared to the power cost to drive something even like a Bluetooth low energy, rate, it is so much smaller that it is almost negligible. And um, once you've done that, once you've taken communication away from the power budget of your standard internet thing style sensor, and what you're left with, which is uh, powering a set of sensors, uh, processing that sense data, and then transferring that to this RFID memory, 
those are by far the least power hungry things that you would do in a standard IoT sector architecture. And once we've taken that line, at, line item out of the power budget, it turns out there's a whole lot that we can do on a very small power supply. And so that power supply could be a battery. It could also be some source of harvested energy. Uh, it could be solar, it could be a thermal gradient, it could be vibration. Um, and it could even be the same RF that is, that is being implicitly harvested by the communication. But uh, the point is, you can do a whole lot with not very much by um, writing smart software on the microcontroller and doing smart analog front end designs for your sensor interface and, and obviously picking up low power cuts. Now, what we've ended up doing is focusing on just using the battery. Because it turns out we can go a very long way on a very small battery. And we don't have to worry about doing the extra analysis to say, okay, this power that I would be harvesting, is there going to be a sufficient amount of it out there for the sufficient so the battery thing is certainly a waypoint right now for us, but um, it is, it turns out we have so much wiggle room just using a small expendable coin cell battery that we really haven't yet had to push a lot into uh, looking at harvestable sources. And so, um, so to, to pull out to the 30,000 foot level a little bit, you know, at this point in the story, what we're trying to figure out is, can we use RFID to stream these this developmental flight instrumentation sensor data and to do it for you know a reasonably long amount of time on a small battery, and so that that shot us into the work that I'm going to be talking about today, which was essentially in parallel doing the analysis to see if this made sense while actually just building the system up and trying. It out. And so to 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 do that, our task tour we had to design a very low power sensor front end. Uh, we had to find some good RFID ICs out there. Then we had to build the prototype hardware and assess its mass, assess the power requirement, assess the achievable data rate um, that we could do, assess the scalability, the population of types that we could do, and assess for this, you know, kind of cockamamie application of RFID sticking it deep down inside a space vehicle, would we even be able to cover all the areas that we want to cover? And we close it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you real quick through the hardware that we built and, and, and just give you some uh, ideas of, of the dimensionality of it, and then we'll get a little bit more into the results of how it. So um, we've taken this hardware through uh, quite a number of iterations. The present talk today is really rooted in uh, a paper that I presented in uh, spring of 2017 to the IEEE Aerospace Conference. Today's slides update the hardware in there, and they update some of the dimensional information and the math information. Part. Um, so, so what you're seeing today is the current version of this bag. Uh, the work has been proceeding ever since then. We're at the point now where we have been uh, funded to effectively wrap, uh, wrap up development on the system, get it to the point that it is uh, commercializable if there are any partners that would wish to commercialize this. And, um, and build a few development kits out there that we can use to, to show people the functioning of it. So the current um, thermocouple interface tag we have right now, we're calling it the uh, uh, PCTAG version one. It is the tag itself with a battery, and that's a BR2330A battery you see there. So that is a, a slightly, uh, that is a, a higher temperature range version of the CR2330 battery that you see um, that you see in like the key fob for your remote keyless entry. It has slightly more capacity than the CR2032, but not, not a whole lot. If you go look at our IEEE paper, we, we analyze the, the lifetime for both of the CR. Um, so there's that tag. It's fairly light with the battery. It's 0.02 pounds. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, a little more than one and a half inches on a side and a little less on the other. Um, to, to drive the overall uh, mass requirements down, we, um, we had to come up with an, uh, an antenna design that was fairly high performance because, you know, instead of your normal one over R squared path loss, you've got one over R to the four now because you have to backscatter that interrogator um, energy back to the interrogator and have enough left over in the meantime to activate your IC and run it. So we leveraged a lot of uh, textile antenna work that our branch has been doing to design a very low mass but high performance and a uh, metal mount uh, 900 megahertz antenna to interface with these because we are using the, the common EPC Global Class 1 Generation 2 RFID protocol that, that it's used everywhere in inventory management uh, 
to architect. Uh, that tag is a uh, very low mass. It, it, it's, uh, I'm sorry, that antenna is very low mass. It's about 0.02 pounds. You can see there a picture of the antenna um, interface to the board with another uh, e-textile uh, shielded enclosure around the printed circuit board itself, again, to, to give that some EMI, EMC protection uh, while also having a very low mass. And then interfaced out to the thermal couple wire that you would see running down inside uh, the heat shield of the table. Um, we have a couple of those housing concepts. We looked at rigid housing and, and, and all textile housing, but we've been able to make the textile housing work and, and we like the mass traits on that. So uh, as far as the sensor architecture goes, this is kind of where our design is. So I'm going to move on. Um, we have to have an RFID interrogator structure to uh, our interrogator system to actually talk to these tags and command them to start getting data and collecting that data. Uh, what we've done here is we have leveraged an RFID interrogator design that our branch has built and flown to the International Space Station under the guise of the RFID enabled, RFID -enabled Autonomous Logistics Management Realm. The interrogator itself is referred to as Ember or Embedded RFID Interrogator. Um, it's, a, it's a ThingMagic 4-port EPC Global Class 1 Gen 2 interrogator that's interfaced to a Gumstick's uh, single-board Linux processor. Uh, that effectively allows it to be networked and to do software control of the RFID interrogator. And There are, um, I believe, six of these on station right now with uh, four antennas each that are monitoring... Uh, uh, the interiors of uh, US lab node one and node two, and also the interfaces. We redesigned this, um, you know, uh, Ember as it was, was designed to operate uh, inside the station environment or IVA, uh, internal vehicle activity in NASA nomenclature. Um, that was not going to survive the environment that we expected to install this in, in Orion. And I should be clear, this is this is installed in Orion inside would have been installed in a vehicle like Orion inside the heat shield but outside of the crew pressure vessel so it will be uh, exposed to vacuum it will be exposed to the temperature extremes both hot and cold you would expect in the uh, the non-habitable environment of the vehicle we redesigned the housing on this um, to be a little bit more robust and to do all of its thermal management uh, via uh, direct thermal conductivity rather than any kind of airflow since we're not going to have any air to flow. And uh, the overall size of that box you see there is uh, you know, about six inches by four inches by two inches. Um, the, the scalloping that you see around the edge, uh, that was all designed for uh, EMI, uh, electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility results. Uh, you see the four ports of the, uh, the for connecting the four RFID interrogator antennas, and then uh, there's a fairly big socket on the front that is your data or the power. And uh, when, that is, when that is operating continuously for something like RFID interrogation, that's going to dissipate about 12 watts. Um, this has to be interfaced to a number of interrogator antennas. Again, we leaned on the Realm project for this. They had already designed a low form factor 900 megahertz RFID antenna for instrument station because your standard uh, Cushcraft panel antennas would be too big for the station environment. They had to design something a little smaller, um, both in volume and in footprint, while still maintaining the performance of you know your most competitive uh, 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 interrogator antennas out there. And then we harvested some mass reductions in that and uh, hardened it for installation. The mass of each antenna there uh, with a small pigtail coming And so this is just the system diagram that you would expect. You have one of these, um, we're calling, you know, we base this on the, um, the Ember design. We're calling our overall system IRIS for Internal Radio Frequency Instrumentation System. So what you see here is an IRIS interrogator interface to one of the Realm antennas. Um, it is talking to a number of RFID tags that are themselves interfaced to thermocouples that are embedded uh, inside the heat shield. And you would have, you know, up to four of these interrogator antennas each talking to a population of these tags that are mounted either uh, against the heat shield or against the back shell of the vehicle, which also has a thermal couple thermal protection. So 
the power power consumption again. You know, we're considering that we're going to have operate in two modes. One is that we're going to hibernate until we're commanded into an active mode, and the other is that when we're in an active mode, we're going to sample our attached thermocouples at 10 samples per second, and we're going to transmit that wirelessly over the air. Now, the way that we transmit it is uh, by uh, aggregating those set of samples into packets that contain 150 samples in a millisecond. And, um, you know, I say transmit again, again, like I said for free earlier, transmit is kind of uh, kind of in, in quote fingers here because, you know, we, we're building this architecture up so that it has all the advantages of an IoT style sensor, which means we make the processor think it has a push channel, but in fact, there's really a full channel. So um, building that up, writing the software to govern all this, uh, and trying to write low, as low power software as possible, we're able to um, measure the currents in the two mode, both hibernation and active. We hibernate at about three microamps. Uh, we're active, we're you know, sampling and streaming at about 48 microamps. And if you do the, uh, the battery lifetime calculation on that BR2330A I referred to earlier, that gives you about nine and a half years hibernating lifetime about 223 days active. Now this is, these uh, these figures here are based on uh, measurements that we took of those two phases, and calculating what the lifetime should be. I should say, since this paper was published, we did start a long-term torture test of four of these tags. And um, as of today, we are, we are almost up to 200 days continually operating these tags. And there, uh, there has not been a real significant battery degradation yet. So. I suspect we're gonna we're going to easily hit that 225 days and perhaps forecast it. But we've got another month or two before I can say that with confidence. Okay, so that's building the hardware up. That's writing the software for it. That's testing to see do we get lifetimes that we think would be useful for uh, long integration cycles and getting ourselves to Mars. The other is, you know, the other side of that coin is, can you actually write the software to do this? Can you build the system? Can you make it work? Um, and so a big part of that was saying, okay, so, you know, fine, theoretically, we think this works, but but how does this actually scale? Could we instrument, uh, you know, a lot of uh, thermocouple points or, you know, other low data rate sensors inside a vehicle of interest? And so what we did is, you know, we, we built a prototype interrogator. We built a lot of these tags. We built a lot of these tech cameras. And then we um, we took we took the uh, CAD from the Orion vehicle itself, and we got the outer mold line of um, one of the six aft base sectors on this vehicle. So these would be like the if you think of um, Orion as a Hershey's Kiss, this would be like the fat part of the Hershey's Kiss at the bottom, but a, a one sixth of that uh, going around the circumference. So we built this according to the outer mold line, and we said, okay, let's just put a lot of these tags in there, and let's start to put stuff inside it like we would expect in a ride. You know, uh, avionics boxes, uh, wiring, uh, plumbing, all that kind of stuff, and see, you know, as we start to clutter that up, you know, can we actually operate this system end to end, you know, from from interface to a thermocouple all the way to you know display of uh, uh, sense data as it comes. So we built 50 tags. Uh, we built, uh, uh, you'll see in the next slide, you know, fairly crude mock-ups of uh, propellant and coolant tanks there. Uh, and uh, then we interfaced that to a prototype reader with uh, two antennas. So that's in the next slide. So this is kind of uh, looking down the side. You see, uh, you know, these are these are essentially just uh, uh, foam uh, spheres or styrofoam kind of pill-shaped things with uh, aluminum tape wrapped around them to give a, a big RF obstruction that, that, you know, mocks up the kind of uh, clutter that you would see inside the vehicle. Um, then with uh, 50 of these tags installed on the inside and then two of the Realm 1 antennas there, one on uh, each of the, each each end of the bay mounted on the, the gussets that in the Orion vehicle section. So, um, and what we saw, we, we ran a number of experiments. Uh, we did 100, you know, 100 hours uh, worth of experiments and um, over 50 of these tags. So um, that's 101 hour experiments where we start the system up, we let it stream PC data and uh, uh, 
one sample or 10 samples every second. And what we saw is that uh, with um, the software overlay that we've built to do this, and I should stress the, the real secret sauce of doing this data streaming over this RFID link, it's all in the software. It's software on the interrogator side, it's software on the tag side, it's software that tricks the attached processor on each sensor into thinking it's just got a little channel that it essentially gets to blast UDP sensors, uh, but in such a way that it all gets back to the interrogator. And what we saw, you know, with um, all of the mitigations and protections that we had built in, uh, we're essentially getting no packet loss. We did have um, one, uh, one, one tag that the hardware progressively failed on over time. We repeated this with a second, uh, second set of 101 hour experiments, saw another hardware failure there. So it you know, two things out as, uh, as outliers and, and, and very easily identified hardware failures. You know, we can say that essentially with the software overlay, we can use this. And, um, and, and again, you know, kind of getting back to the software side of it, that's really where the innovation is. So um, we, have, uh, we have gone and um, filed for a provisional patent on that technique. And the, uh, the final patent application has been submitted. So this is certainly something that we're in a position to talk to uh, external partners about through our technology transfer office. If there are any interested uh, potential commercial partners out there, so um, so that kind of tells you what our our um, average error rate is. Now, there's another question about you know how does this scale? What kind of throughput can we get? From and so what we can do is we can we can figure that out by measuring the average interrogator to uh, tag access time, and you know knowing knowing the the rate at which these tags are going to be filling up their memory, the challenge is the interrogator has to visit each tag in the population of 50 in a round robin fashion and recover that tag sensor data before that tag is ready to overwrite its memory with new sensor data. And so uh, measuring the average interrogator to tag interface there and then calculating that into the, the data transmission period, what you see is that, you know, theoretically, this would let you scale up to about 480 of these 10 samples per second tags per reader. Um, and then, you know, there's there's some retry overhead in there as well, but we measured that and, and it's so small. And so what that tells you is that, you know, even though we've only tried this up to 50 tags, it should scale quite gracefully as you add tags to the population. Um, I would say with great confidence, you could support in excess of 100 tags per interrogator. Um, you know, Getting up to 480, I think you will probably start to see effects from the processing burden on the interrogator side as you get up there. Um, but I do think that you know uh, you're going to be able to to scale in excess of 100 uh, with with great certainty. And it also kind of depends to a certain degree the quality of the RF coverage between uh, each of your interrogator antenna options and tags. And stuff. Which then raises the question, okay, how, how well do you think your coverage is going to work here? And I should say that, that we, we were fortunate enough when this project started, before we started designing any hardware, or started designing any software, to get at uh, what was left of the EFT-1 vehicle after it had flown its test flight in uh, November of, I think, 2014, 2015. I could be wrong about that. But it was around that time. So... Uh, we got access to it the following summer. It was in, um, it, I, I can't show you pictures of what the vehicle looked like when we saw it, but I will say that this image here that I got from NASA.gov is very similar to the state of the vehicle when we were able to access it. Um, and so, you know, the, the heat shield was removed, the back shells around that kind of fat part of the Hershey's Kiss were removed. But what we were able to do is go in with uh, uh, large swaths of conductive fabric and uh, reconstruct the outer mold line of the heat shield and the back shell and really kind of uh, rebuild the resonant cavity that you would expect inside those aft bay areas. And we, um, just using a commercial RFID interrogator and some commercial RFID tags, we were able to um, put a large number of RFID tags inside this environment and then start to assess, you know, can we feed them while we're doing an interrogation? And so that was kind of a, a first gut check. And then um, in parallel, while we were doing the, the hardware build that we saw earlier and doing the, you know, the analysis of scaling, the analysis of the lifetime, 
Uh, we also uh, embarked on a computational electromagnetics assessment of the inside of the vehicle to see, okay, do we think we can actually close the leaks? And so that's, I'm just gonna work you through the end of that and then uh, we're gonna be done. We looked at this for two of the, the aft-based sectors of the vehicle. Uh, you know, uh, incredibly non-scientifically walking around the vehicle, we declared aft-based sector D there to be the least cluttered and that is not in the foreground of this image, but you can kind of see it around the side and, and then we'll show you a rendered pad of that. And then we declare, uh, uh, okay, so yeah, this is what the cab looks like. Um, again, this is for what we declare to be the, the least cluttered. We're kind of looking down from the top of the vehicle and you see the back shell, you see the heat shield, and you start to see the avionics boxes that are in there. What we wanted to do was say, okay, let's make some assumptions on the noise floor of the interrogator. Let's make some assumptions on the interrogator's optical power. Let's um, take a take a, a CEM model of antennas that we're designing to interface to these parts and, and let's take uh, from the data sheets of the RFID chips inform information about their sensitivity and that we've got a good match with the, uh, the antenna that's interfaced to it. And so um, I'm going to show you the result today of analyzing coverage from just one particular uh, interrogator antenna to a population. So that's, that's kind of what the tags look like and the interrogator antenna looks like there. A little cluttered, so I'm going to click through and I'm actually going to pull all those guts out. And you see, okay, now here's the source antenna, the tag antennas. The one that's labeled is tag six there. And it's actually, uh, that's on the heat shield, but it's it's tucked under the uh, the bottom part of the crew pressure vessel. So it's in, you know, a very small space between the pressure vessel and the heat shield there. So it's not actually in the, the band but it's kind of a uh, um, open space, a very small open space that extends off the larger cavity of the bay. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to back the interrogator power down from its maximum output, which is about uh, one watt or uh, plus 30 dBm. And um, the things that I'm going to put in, uh, in green boxes there are say that we've got right coverage to the tags, uh, green circles is read coverage to the tags. It's important to assess both of these because we do have a bi-directional communication interface. The, the RFID interrogator can both send information to and receive information from these tags. That's how it wakes them up to tell them to start sampling. That's how it puts them into uh, you know, health and status uh, mode to communicate some of their um, health information back to the interrogator. But um, for the particular memory architecture on these tags, the read sensitivity is actually greater than the write sensitivity. So we do have to make sure that we can close that lower write sensitivity link to be able to you know, interact with the tags and kick off the process of sampling. So here we are, we're at 30 watts to maximum output power. You can actually, 30 watts is FCC max, you can actually, or sorry, one watt, 30 dBm. You can actually take it up to about a watt and a half if the FCC isn't ever um, back that off to 100 milliwatts or plus 20 dBm, we start to see we can actually still close all the links. You know, this is the less cluttered bay, so that's uh, that's great. Um, and then back that off even further um, down to uh, 30 milliwatts. So, um, you know, at, at that point in time, we really are, we start to lose a little bit of right coverage, uh, especially to the tag that is deep inside the vehicle, um, and then to the one that's parked. But you know that that gives us quite a bit of margin between the maximum amount of power we could be using and the maximum amount of power we are using. And also, you know, that is just for one interrogator antenna location in this bay. We would probably have at least two antennas covered by the Notionally, for the the six sectors of Orion, we kind of thought about putting three four ported interrogators in there with um, two antennas. So now this is that same bay, but looking at tags on the back shell of the vehicle. So we're in the inside looking out. We're going to do the same analysis. So one watt, we cover everybody. 100 milliwatts, we still cover everybody. 30 milliwatts, we uh, we lose right coverage. But, you know, again, that shows us uh, that, that we should expect to have pretty good coverage, especially at the higher output power. And again, this is all an approximation. Your mileage will vary, but um, you know, as a as a a fairly sophisticated sanity check. It gives us a lot of confidence. Uh, going forward. 
So now we're going to look at the most cluttered bay. It's this front one that has a lot of those, those tankages in there that we attempted to reconstruct in our mock-up. That's what it looks like with the tankagen. We'll pull all that out. Again, the same thing we saw before. 30 milliwatts, I'm sorry, 100, uh, 1 watt plus 30 dBm, we're good. You know, now things are a little more complicated, so we back that off to plus 20 dBm or 100 milliwatts. We do lose write coverage to one of the tags. You know, things get worse as we back off from that. Um, and we don't have a, a back shell analysis to go along with that. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here so that we have a couple minutes uh, for questions. Um, so, um, you know, essentially the summary of accomplishments here is that we have demonstrated an extremely low mass sensor architecture that, that has all of the conveniences of an IoT style architecture. You know, our tag mass um, aggregate with the antenna and the housing is less than a tenth of a pound per tag. The infrastructure mass for, you know, one interrogator and two antennas is a little more than two and a half pounds. Um, that mass trade scales very well as you include more and more tags in there. So if you were to, you know, hang 150 tags off of that uh, interrogator plus two antennas, you know, then that, that you know, the, the aggregate mass really goes down to about uh, 0.1 pounds. It's an extremely battery efficient architecture. We've got, you know, almost nine and a half years of hibernating time. That's, you know, being instantly responsive to wake up commands over the air. 220 days of, you know, acquiring and wirelessly streaming data at uh, 10 samples per second once you do wake up. That's an either or. So, you know, the both end would probably be something in excess of nine years of hibernation and something in excess of 200 days. That's still plenty to get you to Mars and back. Uh, the architecture has been demonstrated to be scalable. We've shown doing it for 50 tags. Our analysis says we should be able to get well in excess of 100 tags per aggregator. And our uh, CEM analysis is, confirms that, you know, you know, anywhere from 100 milliwatts to 1 watt interrogator power up, which should, should be sufficient to cover, cover by the time. So, um, you know, an update uh, from the time we published the paper, we're preparing this for commercialization and flight demonstration. We've done a lot of environmental testing on it. So we've done EMI, EMT testing, vibe testing, thermal vac testing. Uh, we're exploring higher data rate extensions of this, and we've done some prototyping in that direction. So to eliminate the low data rate restrictions of, uh, of uh, RFID alone to start to do some hybrid active passive architectures that we think really has the potential to turn this into a one-stop shop for incredibly long-lived wireless vehicle development. Um, we are seeking flight demonstration opportunities now that we've done just about all the environmental testing we can do on the ground. Really, the last thing that we have to do is try to find a vehicle to fly this on. Uh, uh, DTO, as we say in NASA terms, or uh, discrete test objectives. And then, um, you know, we are continuing development on the system to decrease mass, to increase battery lifetimes, look at power harvesting, increase the data rate with some of those hybrid architectures. Uh, uh, increase the number of reference designs for sensors. We don't consider ourselves to be sensors people. We consider ourselves to be data transport people. And so um, really all we need is uh, sufficiently low power sensors where the, uh, the sensor bandwidth is well matched to the, the kind of throughput we have on our system. So that's where I'm going to stop. Um, I see a few questions in here. Uh, I can start to go through those. I can throw it back to Joel if he uh, wants to say anything before we move on. Ray, Ray, I sure will. First, I'll just say you have impeccable timing. You're right. We have time for a few questions, and we have a few. Uh, first, Judy has asked, how customizable is the DAQ content, in particular for chemical detection and oil spills? And would you recommend manufacturers for this technology? Um, so that's um, that's a really good question. It's quite customizable. Um, we, in fact, are working right now on uh, you know this is this is the vehicle in instrumentation solution that has its own unique problem and its own unique set of challenges. We are working on a a wearable offshoot of this technology right now, and the thing that we are targeting is uh, chemical detection. And so. Uh, as long as you have sufficiently low power sensors, this is quite well matched to that sort of thing. As far as recommending manufacturers for it, you know, we've really been building all of our hardware so far. And, but as I mentioned, you know, um, 
the the vehicle instrumentation part of this is licensable technology from the the Johnson Space Center Tech Transfer Office. The uh, the wearable aspect um, is, I suspect, very shortly going to be what licensable technology uh, from the JSC Technology Transfer Office. So this is certainly the sort of thing that we could enter into a partnership with and start to talk about, you know, how to take this from, you know, very, very solidly vetted prototypes on our end to uh, something that is it is manufactured and, and available commercially. We, we definitely want to see this become commercialized and um, and our current source of funding on the vehicle instrumentation work really is dedicated to us getting a package assembled, you know, um, uh, reference hardware designs, uh, reference software designs, drawings, documentation that can be handed off for commercialization. All right. And our next question asks, could you place RFID tags on metals and what is the max interrogating distance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, these tags you could, and then that's part of the reason why we spent so much time working on that textile antenna that I alluded to. Is uh, you know, it is if you've seen RFID tags in, in the wild, you know they're they're usually kind of a thin film with some some kind of uh, metal inlay squiggle on there. Those tags are great. They're very low mass. They're not particularly large, but they do not at all do well on metal. They detune when you put them on. So we have worked very hard to get low mass, high performance antennas that could be mounted on a ground plane. You know, inside these vehicles, we are sticking these on metal. Um, as far as the max interrogation distance goes, uh, you know, the, the the rule of thumb for EPC Global Class One Gen Two with well designed antennas is about you know 10 meters or 30 feet. Uh, we've with some of uh, our designs, we've we've certainly gotten out to about that far. Finally, Gregory Nichols asks, since these RFID tags will be used in vehicles on deep space missions, is there any concern regarding radiation damage? So um, there, there are a few ways to answer that. Um, there's always a concern regarding radiation damage, um, but and it really kind of does depend on what your, how you design the tag. Right now, um, the tags that we're designing, the, the memory on the tag itself is EEPROM. The processor that's interfaced to the tag is largely an FRAM architecture um, with, with uh, CMOS. So all the memory is an FRAM. Really, for those kinds of designs, um, I would expect the, the CMOS on the microcontroller and the, the, uh, the, um, the EEPROM on the tag memory itself to be the problems there. Uh, EEPROM has a lot of problems other than just radiation susceptibility. It tends to wear out pretty quickly, but um, FRAM is incredibly radiation hard. And so what we've been doing is we've been making maximum use of the memory, the FRAM memory inside that microcontroller that we're using to mitigate a lot of both the radiation and the, the wearing problems on the EEPROM. We are also working with manufacturers right now that are trying to bring uh, FRAM RFID chips to market. Um, this has been eased for a very long time now, but I think they're finally kind of becoming commercially viable. So if we move to an all FRAM architecture, that actually gives us quite a bit of time. And moreover, we have some fairly, uh, we have prototyped some fairly exotic designs that uh, take our hibernation current from three microamps down to almost nothing, um, to the extent that a lot of the other radiation susceptible parts in that architecture would just not be powered uh, during our quiescent times. So I do think we've got a really solid path forward here on a very radiation hard wireless. Well, Ray, thank you again for your presentation today and for those very detailed uh, answers to our questions. Uh, we're bumping up right against the end of the hour. And so that concludes our webinar today. Thank you again for everyone for attending.